Uh, just a couple quick things before we get started this morning. First of all, uh, it's really good seeing all of you and, and so glad that you're here. And uh, secondly, for those of you who are watching and uh, joining in worship with us online, I'm not sure whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you, but we're so glad that uh, you are joining us today. For those of you who are on campus, if you actually look underneath your chair right now, there's, there's just two things I want to call real quick for your, to your attention before I get into the message today. And the first thing is, is that there's an envelope with a card that says thank you on it. And you will notice that it's blank. <clears throat> and what we would like you to do heading into this week of Thanksgiving is think of someone that you would like to express your gratitude to, your thankfulness for. And so we've already bought you the card. All you have to do is write the note and send it to them and just say thanks to them. It's amazing how powerful and affirming it is to hear from someone how important they have been to you. So just take a moment and do that. So that's yours to take with you today. And then there's another little thing. It looks like a little blank notebook, which is exactly what it is. And on the front it says, with a grateful heart. And we're going to ask you to try an experiment for the next 30 days. Every day, find two or three things that you're thankful for. It doesn't have to be big. It can be as simple as that was a really good cup of coffee. To look at that, I didn't hit any red lights on the way to work today. <laughs> Just anything. I got a really good parking spot. You know, the, the dinner was really good. Whatever you're grateful for, mark down two or three things every day for the next 30 days, and this is what I will tell you about that. This will change the kind of Christmas you have. You will head into the holiday season in a much better frame of mind. The challenge in our life is not that there are no good things happening in our lives. Maybe not the things we would prefer, but there's always gifts of grace in every single day, and it's good for us to notice. Our problem is not that they're not there. Our problem is that we don't always see them. And it is amazing. This could be the very best Christmas you've ever had, irrespective of, of whatever else is going on in your life. This could be one of the very best Christmases because your heart and your head will be in the right place. And so we just encourage you uh, to do that. All right. Uh, this morning, we're beginning or continuing a series called Good for the Soul. What is good for your soul? And we're in Matthew, the 11th chapter. And beginning in verse 28, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you... What's the next word? How many could use a little extra rest today? How many are already taking a nap right now? Just, you know, okay. you will, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If I were to ask you if you feel rested, how would you assess that? Some of us would say, well, I didn't get enough sleep last night, or I did get a certain number of hours of sleep. But we can get sleep and still not feel refreshed, not feel awake, not feel aware of what is going on around us. When you think about your life, when you think about this day, when you think about the week that is ahead of you, are you confident about how it's going to go? Or are you anxious about how it's going to go? And how does a sense of feeling rested impact that? Every one of us expect things to happen this week. Do you expect good things to happen or do you expect disappointing things to happen? How many have ever heard the phrase, they're waiting for the other shoe to drop? Yeah? Do you know where that phrase comes from? I looked it up. And, and you're not surprised, I know. And, uh, and it comes from, they used to have these uh, uh, tenant houses in New York City where people were just packed right in on top of each other and the walls were thin and there was virtually no insulation between floors and, and so when someone would come home from work and they would lay down and they would take off their shoe and drop it on the floor you waited for the other shoe to drop you, if you fell asleep before then it was just going to wake you up 
That's where that phrase comes from. So now you have something completely useless to share with someone later this week. It's just one of the many services we provide. It's hard to be at rest when you keep waiting for something to happen. And we all have concerns. Maybe it's a financial concern. Maybe it's a job concern. Maybe it's a family concern. Maybe there's a personal issue that you're trying to sort your way through or figure out. And here's the thing. When we find ourselves being anxious and worrying, we can assume that as soon as that issue is resolved, we will stop worrying. But how many have discovered that as soon as that issue is resolved, your worry detector will find something else to worry about, and then you will attach yourself to that and worry about that. Our mind, our heart, our soul is not at rest. When that's true, sarcasm just flows from us quite freely. Cynicism is our basic view of life. Unloving and uncaring responses tend to come more easily from us. We feel burned out and we feel joy less. These are the symptoms of a restless and a fatigued soul. Very different from a rest-filled soul. So Jesus makes an invitation and he invites people who are weary and worn down. If you are tired, if you are weary, if you are fatigued, if you are exhausted, he says, come to him. Everyone, anyone who's going, who's having that experience in life, they are welcome. So we can, we can lay down. That doesn't necessarily mean that we sleep and we can sleep and not necessarily when we wake, we feel uh, rested. And some people think that what Jesus is saying, if you come to me, then you won't have to do anything else. If you come to Jesus, the meals will just prepare themselves. The diapers will just change themselves. How many think that'd be cool? Yeah, it's not how it works. There was a man one time who he had an incredible increase in agriculture. Jesus tells the story of this guy. It's just unbelievable bumper crop year, far more than he had ever seen before, far more than he had the capacity to even store. And this is what he said. He said, I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones and I will not have to work for many years to come. And this is what he said, so I will eat and I will drink and I will be merry. The only thing he was putting on his agenda is eating, drinking, and partying. And there are some people who think, that's the life. That's the one I want. And, and that night, God comes to talk to this guy. And he starts the conversations with two words. You fool. How many know any conversation that starts with those two words is not a conversation you want to be in? God is not calling us to, uh, uh, God does not call us to a life of inactivity. It's a call to something healthier. He's not calling us to be inactive. You can't find anywhere in scripture where God goes to someone and calls them and says, here's what I want you to do. Nothing. Just take the easy road, find a place, sleep as much as possible, just do as little as possible for as long as possible. There are some people who think that the real spiritual life is vacation. There are some people who think that's what heaven is, an eternal vacation. What are you working for? Who are you working for? That's the real question that begins to get at the issue as to whether we feel rested or not. So God calls us not to inactivity, but to something healthier. There are other people who say, well, you'll feel at rest if you, if you just, just live for the moment. Just live for the moment. Uh, don't worry about the past, let it go. Don't worry about the future, doesn't matter. Just live in the moment. That is not how God designed humans. Not being able to learn from the past and not being able to plan for the future is a great design for a domesticated pet. My dog has not learned anything from the past and my dog is not worried about anything when I come home. 
When I left, the food dish was full, the water dish was full. Her only concern is getting outside before things get out of control. She is the most live-in-the-moment creature I have ever met. And I do not believe that God's grand design for human beings is to make us like Bishans. That's not what it's about. Well, we can be present in a moment, but we can also learn from our past, and we can have a purpose in our future. God doesn't call people to inactivity. He calls them to be active in the things that matter. A rest-filled life and an easy life may not be the same thing. So how does God give us rest? How does Jesus provide this rest? Well, first of all, we have to understand that our weariness is connected to something. There's a reason we feel worn out and, and burdened down. There are things that, that keep us awake when we lay down. What's, what's going on in your mind when you are trying to sleep? That, that is a burden. There are things that you are trying to accomplish through work, not just getting through a work day, not just getting a project complete, but you're trying to accomplish something else through that job. And if that doesn't happen or you feel like it's not happening, that can become a burden. There, there are people that we're trying to impress and we want to make sure they notice when we get something Something right and 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 that can become a burden with there we, we we're trying to get ahead and usually not even just of where we used to be ahead of somebody else and that's a real burden you can try to prove yourself to lots of people and that becomes a burden so when you have all these burdens and you're worn down and you're fatigued Jesus tells us three things to do and the first is come to me, come to Jesus. It's interesting that when Jesus is about to launch his ministry, he's about to go into the ministry of healing the sick and, and, and feeding the hungry and teaching God's word and raising up leaders. And he's going to do all of this in a three and a half year period. It's, it's a major undertaking. And just before he goes into this, he faces, uh, 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 he goes into the waters of baptism. And as he's coming out of the waters of baptism, you can read this in Matthew's gospel, there's actually a voice from heaven, and this is what it says. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. It's amazing how many people have never felt like they heard that from somebody that really mattered in their life. For Jesus, identity and acceptance came before ministry. That's a really important point. He didn't work to achieve acceptance and his identity and his love from his father. He worked out of the rest that came from being accepted and loved. When others rejected him, he hadn't lost everything. He still had the love and the acceptance of his father. Yeah. We all know what it's like, at least I hope we do, at some point in our life to have someone who just gets us. They understand us. They appreciate us. They like to be around us. We feel relaxed when we are around them. There's a kind of rest that we experience when, they're, when we're in the presence of people who get us. And for Jesus, his father was that. And our Heavenly Father can be that for us. Apart from God's acceptance, by grace, our soul actually becomes fatigued. Because the only one who really gives unfailing love is our Heavenly Father. Our soul can become fatigued. And when it does, our body feels very fatigued and exhausted. It wears us out. Our mind begins to feel fatigued. We have trouble making decisions. Our, our resolve begins to feel fatigued. We, we find ourselves unable to sort through or we're constantly trying to push down unhappy and what we know to be unhealthy emotions. And we keep stuffing things down, having trouble making decisions, constantly feeling fatigued and tired, going from one room to the next. Soul fatigue has all of those effects on us. And sometimes we can't even make a decision, even a simple decision. Do you, do you want lemon ring pie? Do you want chocolate pie? Do you know what my answer is? Yes. 
And it's not because I can't make a decision. My decision is I want both. But you would be surprised how many times we don't choose between things, not because we want both. We just, we don't know how to say no to anything anymore. It's a sign of a fatigued soul. So, Come to Jesus. That love and acceptance provides a kind of rest that you can operate out of instead of constantly trying to earn. Then secondly, take my yoke. Take on the yoke of Jesus. Instead of trying to do everything in your own strength. The purpose of a yoke was to share the strength of two or more animals who were responsible in those days for pulling a plow or for pulling a cart. And when you combine the strength, when you hear about horsepower in cars, well, that car has 850 horsepower. That means that's the equivalent of 850 horses. That's how they thought about it. It was a way to share strength. Shared strength is needed because the thing that is being pulled or the field that is being plowed is too much for one animal to manage. There are things that are too much in our lives for us to manage on our own. So Jesus offers to, to have us come into a yoke with him so that he can share his strength with us. Without that shared strength, we're not going to get the job complete and we're probably going to do some damage to ourselves and maybe to others along the way. Now, I have an indicator on my phone that tells me when the battery is going low. I have a gauge in my car that tells me when I'm low on gas and I need to find a gas station. Where is our gauge for our soul? How do we know when we're running out of gas internally? Now, what's interesting about the yoke is not only does it share strength, it also determines the pace that you move at. If you try to move faster than your yoke mate, you're just going to be not only frustrated, but you're going to get really tired because you're trying to drag, in addition to a plow, another animal in the yoke. Jesus never needed to hurry in life, and we hurry way more than we need to. Hurry is a habit, and we get into it. I recently listened to an interview of a person who does training for service industry, like hotels and things like that. And one of the things they said is pre-COVID, the average amount of time it took a person to become frustrated enough to start acting in an inappropriate way was eight minutes. Eight minutes. You put a person in line and about the eight minute mark, we crack. So what they would do is they would go out at six minutes and they would give you a snack and something to drink. And they would, they would extend your time that you could tolerate this. Post-COVID, people's tolerance is under 30 seconds. We'll, we'll go into the bank, we'll go into the grocery store, we'll go into wherever, and we'll just we'll look at the line and go, nope. <laughs> we just walk out, what, what happened? We're in a hurry, why? Really, that much of a hurry? Really? If you're moving faster than Jesus, you're moving too fast. We have to think about this. A full schedule is one thing. That's not bad. Being preoccupied all the time about all the things we have to do, that's not good. Lots of activities is one thing. Not being able to be present for anything, that's another thing. Being busy is an outward condition. Being hurried is an inward condition. Physically tired is one thing. Spiritually tired is another thing. When you look at all the things you have to get done in this week, does it remind you how much you need God? Or does it actually cause you to be unavailable to God? That's worth knowing. Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. When we submit to the pace of Jesus and share in the strength of Jesus, it begins to affect our lives. We actually notice things that are good, things that we can be thankful for, things that are beautiful. We find a kind of liberation, a freedom from having to manage the opinions of everybody else that we walk through because we're operating out of the rest of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
you will find rest for your soul. Jesus used to go away to quiet places just by himself, and he would call his disciples to take a break from work. He wasn't about doing something 24-7. Uh, I, I heard a pastor one time say, you know, well, the devil never takes a day off. My question is, whose example do you want to follow? Just think about it. They would get together, the disciples, and they would tell stories, and, and they would ask questions, and they would eat food, and they would laugh, probably at something that Peter said. I mean, he just was constantly putting his foot in his mouth. The reason the disciples were so effective in ministry was they submitted to the pace of Jesus, and they shared the strength of Jesus. There's so much wisdom in this. Come to Jesus. Take his yoke. We need to stop asking Jesus to give us the strength to live an unhealthy life. Don't we do this? Enjoy the Sabbath. In the ancient world, slaves never got a day off. You are not a slave. You are a child of God. You are a friend of Jesus. Enjoy the Sabbath. Take all the days off in your vacation. Sometimes we brag about, oh, I never take a vacation. That's not good. You know, we, we used to say a week consisted of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then we're back to Sunday. Now it's just blurs day over and over and over again. Come to Jesus. Take the yoke of Jesus and then learn the methods of Jesus. Learn to be gentle and humble. Gentleness and humility is actually offensive to people who are constantly trying to increase their power and their prominence. Sometimes they don't even know who they are apart from money or power or reputation. It was interesting to me that in two of the three temptations that Jesus faced before he went into ministry, on two of those occasions it was to prove who he was. If you're really the Son of God, then do this. If you're really the Son of God, then do this. I have a secret suspicion that two of the three temptations that we face is an effort to try to prove ourselves to someone. And then the third temptation was a shortcut to get something. Not that the, what he wanted was wrong, but the way to go about it was not right. Jesus is quite different than that. This leper touching, tear shedding, foot washing, parent obeying, couch surfing, temptation facing, social rule shattering, blood sweating, cross bearing, cheek turning, non-condemning man changed the world and every single life that he ever gently touched by it. That's who Jesus is. He doesn't come in. I know this is what our culture craves. They want a strong man with a strong voice and knows how to, to wield a sword or a hammer and pound into submission everything and everyone that doesn't agree with us. You will wear yourself out looking for that person. You will wear yourself out trying to beat that person. Jesus impacted the entire world and 2,000 years later, still the most well-known person in human history. And he did it because he was gentle and humble in heart. That was the difference maker. It suffocates us when we grab for power and we grab for wealth and we try to manipulate others. Our soul thrives in gentleness and humility. So have you started your friendship with Jesus? I'll ask the worship team to come out. Are you choosing the pace of Jesus? Are you sharing the strength of Jesus? Have you learned how to have a more gentle response? Maybe take a lower place. Just watch how God uses that. If you're doing any of those things, you will find rest for your souls. When you looked at the people surrounding Jesus, there were some people who were thrilled to have him in the room. They walked out feeling energized and hopeful. Freer, loved, at peace that the God of the universe 
actually knew what was going on in their lives and he cared enough to do something about it. And when you live like that, the plows, the fields still need to be plowed and the dishes still need to be done and the kids still need to be cared for and you still have to show up to your responsibilities. But the way you show up, quite different. I know, I can make a list of all the things. I listened to somebody on the way into church this morning. They had a list of all the things that was wrong with our world. I could have driven from here to the other end of the country and he'd have still been going on. It's not the problem. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. We can find rest for our souls. The religious people didn't like this gentle and humble Jesus, this man who would eat with anyone, who would talk with anyone, who would heal anyone, who would feed anyone. This fame shy man is still changing our world. And he came to serve rather than be served, but he served out of rest. Let's bow our heads. I'm not asking if you're tired, you probably are. I'm not asking if you got enough sleep last night. That's not the deciding factor. Is there rest for your soul? Come to the acceptance, the love and the friendship of Jesus. Learn to pace yourself with Jesus and share the strength of Jesus. Learn his gentle and humble ways and watch what a difference it makes. Heavenly Father, you love us with an unending, everlasting love. Would you help us rest in that today? You've come to share your strength with us, not demand more from us. Help us receive that today. You actually call us to, to take steps that are gentle and humble, that when we're not striving to prove or take, we actually find rest for our souls. Would you do all of that in our lives today? Because our world desperately needs people who have found rest for their souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.